So I'm delighted to be part of this um, wonderful seminar series and on its 70th anniversary. So I'm very honored also on behalf of the other members of the Explo project that I'll be telling you about today. I also want to thank Yanis Galanakis and Andrew for that generous introduction. Well, before going any further, I think I need to explain uh, what Explo is, and I'm going to do that in terms of what, where, and when this project is focused on. So first of all, that, that very long title that Andrew kindly read out, so I don't have to say it again, uh, to do with exploring the dynamics and causes of prehistoric land use change uh, in uh, Europe. This is a synergy project, which is one of the European Research Council's um, set of grants where you can have multiple PIs. And the idea is to bring together the strengths of different institutions. So in our case, it's Albert Hafner and Willie Tinner at the University of Bern, who are focused on dendrochronology and paleoecology respectively. Kostas Kotsakis at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, who is focused on excavations at this period and analyses of material culture. And myself in Oxford focused on the uh, bioarchaeology in the UK sense of seeds and bones from on-site occupation sequences. This project began in 2019 and it runs until March 2025, so we're in the final uh, stretch. And Explo really then is a team of postdoctoral researchers and students who are working at these different institutions. It has featured excavation, both underwater and terrestrial, coring, vegetation surveys, and a heck of a lot of lab work, as I will attempt to convey uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. And I've put together some photos here just to try and give you a, a sense of what this work has been like, including, I have to say, through the pandemic, uh, but also what waterlogged preservation on these lakeshore settlements, what that offers in terms of organic preservation and chronological resolution. So next, uh, where is Explo? So our focus is the Lake District of Northern Greece, the Republic of North Macedonia and Albania. And there are three particular sites which are highlighted on the map here and which I'll come back to uh, throughout this talk. Dispilio on Lake Orestias uh, in the south, Plocha Michovgrad on the eastern shore of Lake Ohrid, and Lin three on the, its western shore, so also on Ohrid. These are all sites that feature pile fields that are suitable for dendrochronological <clears throat> investigation, coring for paleoecological studies, and occupation sequences with excellent organic preservation. Now, you'll be aware that pile dwellings or lakeshore sites are a widely recognized part of the cultural heritage of, of Europe, and in particular, the circumalpine zone, and that's reflected in its World Heritage listing. Those sites have shed remarkable light on Central European prehistory due to organic preservation and also a lengthy research uh, period that began in the mid 19th century. Within the Explo uh, region, Lake Ohrid also uh, has a world heritage listing and unusually it has a dual designation for both natural and cultural heritage. The early pile dwellings are part of that cultural heritage and begin, as we shall see, more than a thousand years earlier than their Alpine counterparts. And that brings me to the when of Explo. Um, so the left-hand panel is a draft overview of dendrochronologically dated phases for the Neolithic part of the project. And that the Neolithic is my focus today. We do have some Bronze Age, some second millennium occupation on these lakeshore sites as well, including even some Mycenaean pottery at this video. I thought I'd just mention that. Um, but in fact, the second millennium is generally much less well-preserved, unfortunately, than the Neolithic, and the Neolithic is, is what I'm going to focus on. So if you look at that um, uh, sort of schematic on the left-hand side, you can see that we have about a thousand years, about a millennium, of lakeshore occupation through the sixth and into the fifth millennia BC in a kind of spatially fluid persistence that I'm going to try and give you a sense of today. For those of you, and I know that there are several of you here that are really immersed in the European Neolithic, you will realize seeing these dates that we are not trying to intercept the very earliest Neolithic, the very first arrivals of farming into Southeast Europe. 
that would take us back into the seventh millennium BC, the 6000s BC. Rather, we're looking at its maturation, its adaptation to inland and somewhat higher altitude conditions. Now, the right hand panel, which I realize for those at the back of the room uh, in person here have, have no hope of seeing the detail, <laughs> but I will explain what it's what it's what it's uh, included for. And that is that um, this is some of the um, resolution that we can achieve with dendrochronology, what the team in Bern uh, can bring to that. The bars that you can see, which are either black or orange or green, that's for different tree species. That's showing you the lifespan of different trees that are represented in the dendrochronological sequence. So what happens in a region like this where there hasn't been already a long history of dendrochronology is lots and lots of radiocarbon dating of the individual tree rings of those uh, trees. Uh, that is the, the vertical timbers that are represented in the pile fields. And the really key date that we get from those is of course their felling date when they were cut down. And so you can hopefully see that there is a gray bar down the middle of that diagram. That bar is spanning the contiguous set of felling dates that we have. And this is for one of the explosites, Plocha Mitrovgrad, which dates to the mid fifth millennium BC. And that sequence of felling dates tells us that there is continuous occupation involving the felling of trees and construction for 87 years. <laughs> and that 87 years comes from uh, not the entire pile field, but from a 100 meter square region of it that has been intensively sampled. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of the very detailed windows that become accessible to us chronologically, and I'll try and put that in a broader context shortly. So in this talk, I'd like to frame these emerging results from the EXPLO project, particularly as regards the on-site bioarchaeology, that's our focus in Oxford, but also looking at those synergistic links to the work uh, of the other teams in the whole project that is the entire uh, motivation for the synergy um, program. And I'm going to try and frame this in three ways. First of all, to do with the nature of these lakeshore occupations, are these lakeshore sites a dramatic demonstration of the plasticity or the transposability of Neolithic households and their farming economies to different ecological settings, including these upland lake uh, basins? Or are they rather specialized occupations, for example, for hunting or foraging? A second question is about comparison with dry Neolithic settlement. And of course, much of what we know about Southeastern Europe in the Neolithic period is based on dryland archeology. span So however specialist or generalist these lakeshore sites turn out to be, how do they compare with what we know of practice in the dry side of the Neolithic? And then the third question I will briefly uh, look at is to do with climatic and biogeographical transition zones, such as the Explo study region itself. Are we right to think of these uplands as barriers for Neolithic spread? Or were these upland lake basins, in fact, a testing ground for transitions between Mediterranean and more continental European conditions? So let's start with the question about household plasticity or specialization. And to tackle that, I first need to zoom out significantly. Um, and I'd like to briefly, but only briefly consider what it is that we are tracking in maps like this. So this is a map uh, uh, put together by Detlef Cronenborn and colleagues that's looking at the expansion of farming in Western Eurasia. But what exactly is spreading and connected to that, why is it spreading? Now that is a massive topic uh, that I wouldn't pretend to do justice to and we'd want to have more of a discussion about. Uh, but to make a long story short, it appears that what drives the Neolithic isn't so much cultivation per se, or herding per se, or domestication as a concept. It's the emergence of those phenomena through the social institution of the household. And we're here looking um, uh, in the left-hand part of this slide at domestication traits in cereals and sheep in Western Asia. And it's nice that Dorian could make it today who helped put that figure together. Um, what turns out to be a really key period of morphological change, and in that sense, strict domestication change in Western Asia is the eighth millennium BC, the 7000s BC. And that's what I've highlighted here in, in yellow shading. Then on the right-hand side, I've included some images of households from different parts of Western Asia that date to that millennium. 
So the question is, why is the crystallization or the emergence of households as a social unit entailing these simultaneous biological changes in wheat and sheep, for example? Well, in this schematic diagram, I've tried to capture some of the flows in this process of agricultural emergence. The core dynamic is around labor investment and consequent ownership claims linking cultivation, herding, and householding together. Cultivation and herding emerged as complementary strategies for stretching the possibilities of local sedentism and resilience. Households in Western Asia developed in nucleated aggregations, and these communities became the crucibles of early farming. So the transposability of the mixed farming niche, that is its, its ability to move around and to set itself up in new locations, ultimately led to its dispersal, including then the spread of farming to and across Europe. Biological domestication was a byproduct of that process and was extended in both time and space. So in this way of looking at things, the answer to what is spreading also provides the answer to why. It spread because it could spread. Mixed farming was a robust and a reproducible ecological niche and regime that could translate beyond Western Asia into Central Asia, into North Africa, as well as across Europe. So with the initial spread of farming around the Aegean, and I'm showing here some images from Ulujak in Western Anatolia and from Mavropigi in Western Macedonia, the household reestablishes itself and in local architectural styles and vernaculars. So at Mavropigi, rectangular houses appear in the late seventh millennium BC after initial phases of pit and pit house construction. So this brings us to the turn of the seventh to sixth millennia BC, around which point in the Greek middle Neolithic, a particular aspect of material culture appears. It's best known in Thessaly, but also known from Greek Macedonia, the Republic of North Macedonia, and eventually across the Balkans, and that is clay house models, which I just want to take a brief look at. We're looking at examples here from four different sites of the late Neolithic in Northern Greece. These models variously draw attention to the house interior, and that is a particular feature of late Neolithic house models in contrast to middle Neolithic models that showed the house's exterior as Yorgos Tufexis and others have shown. So you can make out, I hope, from these photographs, ovens and platforms and even human figures uh, and even Bucrania or animal heads of some kind that are shown on either side of house and room entrances. The two examples on the left-hand side, uh, both of them from what were in the Neolithic period wetland settings, so Tumba Kremastis in the Kitrini Limni area and Limnohori II in the Four Lakes region, the Amandeon Basin area, appear to show two-storied buildings. It's even been suggested that they represent pile dwellings um, so material culture of this explicit representational kind is referencing the central social institution of the household and its reproduction. So against that, I realize very briefly sketched background. I'd like to now look at some very specific results coming out of the Explo project to try and situate that whole conversation about houses and households. And so a first stop in this discussion uh, pertaining now specifically to the lakeshore sites in the Explo project and to this question of whether we're looking at a fully functioning Neolithic on the lakeshores or some kind of specialized occupation. A first uh, aspect of that question that we can consider is what can we really say about the houses of these lakeshore settlements? And that brings us to a recent and spectacular breakthrough in dendrochronological dating of piles, that is these vertical timbers, at the site of Vispilio, the southernmost explo site on the southern shore of Lake Orestias, or Lake Castorias. And that breakthrough, which I'll explain uh, in detail now, it was possible because of a recently detected solar proton event, that is a solar eruptive event producing fluxes of solar energetic particles in the late 6th millennium BC and precisely in the year 5,259 BC, BCE. 
And this was detected by measuring radiocarbon in dendrochronologically dated tree ring sequences elsewhere that were already absolutely dated. So the anomalously high atmospheric radiocarbon of tree rings dating to that particular year, 5259, make it possible to align floating tree ring chronologies and indeed ice core chronologies that overlap this date to an absolute time scale. And that is exactly, sorry, I should say that proton, solar proton event of 5259 was only detected in 2022. So there was a huge amount of luck involved in the, that revelation that then could feed into XPLO. So that pinning down of a floating chronology to an absolute timescale is exactly what Andrei Machkowski and colleagues were able to do at Dispilio. And these are all members of the dendrochronology chronolo chronology team at Bern and of the Aristotle University uh, of Thessaloniki Dispilio team. So once absolute felling dates could be identified through this connection, building plans could then be detected <clears throat> by mapping groups of trees that had the same felling date. And that is what you can see in the upper right-hand part of this slide. So this is quite schematic, but what I'm trying to explain is that these colored rectangles in the upper right-hand part of the slide are showing you the outlines of buildings that appear to be houses constructed repeatedly uh, within this about 500 meter square excavation area. So we suddenly have houses where there was a pile field. The full architectural characterization of those houses is, of course, underway, and that's by the, the Vispilio team. But they do appear to be houses. They have house-like inventories, and they are rebuilt over time and clearly overlapping spatially. So a couple of other observations about these houses. One is that collectively, they represent a period of about 200 years of continuous activity in the later sixth millennium BC. We can also look at the spacing of the building events to get a sense of the use life of those individual houses. And in fact, the, the gaps between construction in both the Eastern and the Western part of that excavation area are about 30 years. So that's suggesting that we're looking at a, around about a 30 year duration for a house, uh, house's use life. Now, that estimate of about 30 years is rather similar to house use lives that have been calculated through recent work by Nenad Tasic and Alex Bayliss and Alistair Whittle and colleagues at Vincia Bella Burdo, that is the eponymous site of the Vincia culture in Belgrade on the Danube, and also dating to the later 6th millennium BC. But of course, this is a large tell, one of the largest in southeastern Europe. So they also there through, in this case, radiocarbon dating, but of a very structured kind, were able to um, uh, estimate the duration of a whole sequence of houses, and those durations end up being about 30 to 50 years. This also brings us to a more general observation, which is that in the later 6th millennium BC, we start to see a very dynamic phase in new dispersal patterns of the Neolithic within Southeast Europe, and beyond. And here are some images from another recent study. This is an early, um, actually it's an early site of longhouses, which is a particular Neolithic um, house form that emerges in Central Europe and then spreads westwards. This is a site called Fersend Gelencha in Southwestern Hungary. But what's extraordinary here is that you have a single settlement, part of which has LBK, that is linear band keramic, early uh, linear incised pottery, tradition, and part of it has Vincha pottery tradition. Vincha is the typical North Balkan late Neolithic culture, and part of it still has Starchevo pottery from a previous tradition. So we're starting to appreciate that these traditions overlap in time, and that they're part of cultural identity, and that they are, in fact, uh, uh, symptomatic here of a community that is formed through these different traditions. The date here is significant too, because we're looking then at a site established in the, the sort of the beginning of the second half of the sixth millennium BC. And that's a time of, as I've said, dynamic change, including the spread of the linear pottery or linear incised pottery culture all the way to the Paris basin and the Dutch coast on the one hand, and on the other hand, the formation of the Vincha 
largely tell-based Neolithic of the Northern Balkans on the other. So those major traditions are co-emerging. Uh, they are demonstrating the transposability, the plasticity of the household in the very time frame that we're seeing this uh, Lakeshore Neolithic uh, flourish in Southeastern Europe. And so what's happening with this video is part of a wider phenomenon of Neolithic households pushing beyond old frontiers, as in the case of the LBK, and or forming new kinds of community, as in the North Balkan Vincha tells, including Vincha itself. But what about household activities? What are people actually doing on these lakeshore sites? Are they in fact hunting camps, for example, or are they full on farming households? And at this point, I'd like to briefly introduce um, the Oxford team who include people that many of you will know and who have a lot of experience that they bring to this project. And we're very fortunate uh, to have all of their involvement covering then faunal analysis led by Valasia Izakidu, that is the mammalian skeletal fauna, molluscan analysis by Rena Veropulidu, um, also insect analysis, which is led by Eva Panayatakopoulou at the University of Edinburgh. The others that you can see here are, are variously engaged on the archaeobotanical side of things. Uh, and I'll introduce some of these people to you individually as we talk about results of their work. Well, let's start with the fauna and some of the work that is led by uh, Valasia Izakidu, also of course with Paul Hulstead and assisted by Daphne Andrulaki and Rula Kronaki. So what's very clear from the faunal results so far is that we are not looking at a hunting camp. Hunting accounts for a very small minority of the faunal remains. And this is in fact in continuity with other late Neolithic sites. The faunal material is instead heavily focused on sheep herding as is broadly characteristic of the Greek Neolithic. And I'll say a bit more about that, about that uh, later. So a lot of sheep herding, some hunting, but uh, not an unusual level. To be sure, we also have evidence of shellfish gathering. This is freshwater mussels from Rena Veropoulidou's work, as well as fishing and fish processing of large carp and catfish, which is that scary looking creature uh, that I've included here. That's work by Tatiana Theodoropoulou. But clearly these specifically lakeshore activities of shellfish gathering and fishing were not the exclusive focus of the community. Let's look at this now botanically, and we're now shifting to the work of Jenny Gatsogia and Muge Ergun. The emerging archaeobotanical results are also pretty unambiguous on this. And here we really hit it lucky again, in that a small test trench that was set up to check the stratigraphic sequence next to the older Hamurziades excavations, and that's a test trench excavated by Ioana Siamidu, we encountered a, a concentration of charred cereals, and it really looks like storage material. And it looks particularly like storage of cereals at a kind of semi-processed stage. And for those of you who are not archaeobotanists and not sitting on the second row on the left-hand side at the moment, <laughs> um, I will just explain that the cereals that we're looking at are uh, hulled or gloom wheats, uh, which when you thresh them break into packages that are still with grain enclosed with chaff. So they then require another processing step. And what's happening and, and is typical of the Neolithic in this region is that we're looking at storage at that semi-processed stage. So again, that's, in, that's uh, not a surprise. Grain storage is underlined further by finds of insect storage pests. That's from Eva Paniotokopoulou's work and lots and lots of rodent pellets. We also get abundant processing, that is dehusking evidence from the next stage of cereal processing prior to, to food preparation. I'll come back to some of that later. So it's not that they're just storing this stuff there, they're definitely processing it on a regular basis as well. We also have a lot of plant foraging evidence and I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but clearly that foraging was part of a mixed farming repertoire. We are systematically dating these occupation sequences. And of course we have to do that to tie the occupation into the dendro chronology. The storage deposit I've showed you with a big black arrow where that fits in the sequence. 
And in fact, it dates to that later sixth millennium phase where we have those dendrochronologically dated houses. And in all likelihood, that storage deposit belongs to another house that was extending to the south. Now, those of you who can read tiny writing, I don't know if anyone really can, will notice that towards the bottom of our Bayesian model, we have some dates in the early sixth millennium, so around about 5,700 BC. That parallels, in fact, initial lakeshore settlement at the other explo sites too. So there seems to be a general phenomenon of initial early sixth millennium establishment and then uh, continuation in the later sixth millennium BC. A final strand of evidence that these really are farming households in these lakeshore settings, in case I haven't uh, convinced you yet, is pollen evidence for local clearance and cultivation. In the case of this video, previous work by Katerina Cooley has revealed a sequence that includes clearances that look like they're in sync with the settlement at this video, though the size of the pollen catchment, just the, the scale of the lake, means that we're actually looking at a much wider picture than uh, this video itself. So if we shift to uh, one of the later Neolithic uh, sites in the wider Explo project at Plocha Mitrovgrad on the North Macedonian shore of Lake Ohrid, here the location of the site in a small bay and the possibility of coring the submerged site itself is ideal for pinpointing local cultivation of which there are multiple phases, including the episode that coincides with the preserved cultural layer itself. And that's what's shown in pink. So I know, again, I'm relying on tiny writing here, which, which was, I can see a strategic error, uh, but the, these uh, spikes of decreasing tree pollen and increasing non-tree pollen are signaling clearance events, farming events. And the second of those is the farming event that goes with the preserved cultural sequence in the stratigraphy. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the second question, and I'm, I'm going to uh, not give it quite as much time as I did the first, so don't, don't be anxious. Uh, now I'm looking at continuity or contrast with the dry Neolithic. So if these are fully functioning households, cultivating, herding, et cetera, how do they compare with what households are doing uh, on dryland settlement sites? Are the wet and dry Neolithic actually two sides of the same coin, or are they distinct adaptations? Well, one point of comparison here is to do with uh, chronology and what we can pick up about the duration of occupation. Because famously in Southeast Europe, we're looking at a, a Neolithic that features tell settlements that are themselves, in a sense, monuments to durability, as John Chapman and others have pointed out. So how did the lakeshore sites compare to that? So if we look at duration of occupation, and I'm juxtaposing here this video on the left and the felling dates that you may recall we looked at before, and Plocha Mitrovgrad on the right, which is at the late end of this phenomenon. So we're kind of bookending it. And um, in the case of this video, uh, across this area, excavated area of about 500 square meters where those houses have now emerged. We're looking at a period of about 200 years of continuous occupation. So 200 years in 500 square meters. And on the right-hand side at Plocha, we're looking at about a century of occupation in 100 square meters. So those would appear to be distinctly shorter than some of the tell durations, which I'm gonna remind you how long those last. Uh, in a moment, but we need to bear in mind the possibility that these lakeshore sites have shifted horizontally through time. And there's good reasons for thinking that they have, which I'll come back to in a moment. So thinking about tell settlements, uh, so settlement mounds in the Southeast European Neolithic of this kind of time frame that have been formally modeled uh, uh, using Bayesian approaches. There are several examples we can look at. One is the example by Chris Mee, Bill Cavanaugh, and Josette Renard at Kufovano near Sparta in the Peloponnese. That's a duration of about 800 years, that tell. Uh, it's a small tell, four to five hectares, um, uh, from about 5,800 to 5,000 BC. Another formally modeled Bayesian tell chronology is that from Vincha, uh, the site that we talked about already in terms of house duration, but now we're looking at the whole scope of the occupation sequence. 
which runs from about 5,200 to 4,600 BC, so about 600 years. And similarly, at another Vincha site called Uivar in Romania, so in the eastern part of the Carpathian Basin, we're looking at a, another Vincha occupation of about 600 years. So we could certainly argue that tells appear to be longer lived than these lakeshore sites. Um, but as I've already mentioned, we do have the possibility of horizontal shifting. And in fact, we know that those horizontal spatial shifts are occurring on the flat extended sites that are increasingly well known from the region, such as Mycrelos, where we have about a millennium of occupation. That's Mycrelos in northeastern Greece. I also just briefly wanted to compare this emerging situation where we have lakeshore sites that last or certainly include uh, felling periods of 100 to 200 years with what we know of the Alpine Foreland Lakeshore Neolithic, where we have decades of this dendrochronological dating. And it turns out that the Alpine Foreland sites tend to be shorter lived, if anything, than the Explo examples. They often last for 10 to 20 years only. But thanks to decades of research in heavily developed areas like the northern end of Lake Zurich, where the city of Zurich uh, has funded excavations um, uh, over the years, and also the Bodensee or Lake Constance uh, in southern Germany or between southern Germany and Switzerland, there we can see that these supposedly short-lived settlements are actually just shifting 100 meters this way or 100 meters that way over time. So we are nevertheless looking at long-lived cultural landscapes. Final point about chronology, rescue excavations in the Four Lakes region of the Emendeon Basin, so this is just northeast of Lake Orestias, have detected multiple nearby settlements. And though there hasn't been dead chronology here, we do know from radiocarbon dating that those sites seem to represent sequences over time. So those results, together with the extensive pile fields around the Spilio, which extend far beyond uh, the excavations, suggest that lakeshore settlements probably shifted over time as they did in the Alpine foreland, though of course this will require further research. Well, given the apparent contrast between the somewhat shorter chronologies of lakeshore sites as we currently know them and of dryland tells and flat extended sites in the wider region, which can go up to a millennium or more, we can consider how their economies compare. Is it that the lakeshore sites look just as resilient and as diverse as what's happening on dry sites or not, for example. And for this, we need to look at the bioarchaeology, which I'm going to uh, zoom in to again. And I'm going to start again with this video and look in a bit more detail at some of the faunal work uh, by the team led by uh, Valasia Izakidu. And what we see here are both similarities and differences with typical dryland uh, and lowland sites in Greece. So the dominance of sheep is typical, of course, of many uh, Neolithic sites in Greece, dry sites, but that particularly pronounced dominance is actually an earlier Neolithic feature. In the late Neolithic otherwise, you tend to get more of a balanced representation uh, with increases in pig and cattle. The low percentage of hunting is typical of the Neolithic in general, that isn't particular to this video. But what is uh, more particular to this video and is pointed out in the lower left graph uh, here is the focus of that hunting, which is specifically on roe deer. Uh, that's unusual and may reflect the woodland cover uh, and a particular kind of hunting of roe deer that are invading crop fields uh, from those habitats. Excellent preservation uh, means that we have a lot of measurable specimens from this video, a lot of sexable animals, a lot of pelvis that can be looked at in detail. And this really confirms what we otherwise find to be the case uh, for the Neolithic of Greece, which is that we're looking at a meat type kill off pattern that is a meat oriented uh, culling regime for sheep. Doesn't mean that they're not using other products, but it means that that is the overall uh, sort of multi purpose nature of the rate of the husbandry system. And a final point I'll mention from the faunal uh, team is that we get very high fragmentation of sheep bones due to intensive processing. And that again is very typical for the Neolithic. So uh, in many ways we're seeing 
um, uh, something distinctive, but certainly on similar themes and involving similar practices to what we see elsewhere in the Greek Neolithic. For plants, the different preservation conditions that are uh, available in lakeshore archaeology, that is due to water log logging, due to anaerobic conditions, means that we really get a dramatic contrast between what ends up being carbonized or charred and what is uncharred. And the, that simple contrast boils down to um, crop material, which is what largely accounts for the charred assemblage, and then a much more diverse uh, and especially um, diverse set of foraged plants that is hedgerow uh, fruit and nut taxa that are uh, finding their way into the archaeological record in an uncharred state. Now, those foraged taxa are woodland edge taxa that would be ubiquitous in the region. There's nothing specifically lakeshore about them. And they are the same kinds of taxa that we do find just at much lower levels in charred assemblages elsewhere. So it seems that the charred assemblages that we normally have for the Neolithic are just showing us the tip of the iceberg of foraging. And that's very much the picture that we get from the Alpine Foreland Lakeshore sites as well. Um, and uh, somewhat reassuringly, in uncharred form, we also get lots of crop material. So it's not as though all the crops are weirdly only being charred. We get a lot of them in, in uncharred form also. A lot of munching on grain and processing of cereals and pulses. We get lots of pulse pods as well. So it all kind of boils down to this quite simple contrast. The charred assemblage, it's a cereal story, and the uncharred assemblage is a much more diverse story that tells you more uh, about what's happening with foraging. And just to delve into that foraging a little bit further, it's interesting that this uh, is such a mixture of Mediterranean and what you'd call temperate continental taxa. So we have fig, we have pistachio, we have grape, all those classic Mediterranean things, but mixed up with apples and acorns and hazelnuts and, as you can see here, strawberries, ras uh, raspberries, blackberries, and so on. Okay, now that diverse foraging picture we find over and over and over again on these explo sites. It's not particular to this bio. And I will just zoom in now very briefly to Plocha, which is the mid fifth millennium occupation. So we're now looking 800 years later than this video, and yet they are still doing something very, very similar. Um, what's lovely at, at uh, Plocha, it's submerged, meaning that the um, preservation is superb, but also the cultural layer is very, very deep. So we have a meter and a half of wet midden material <laughs> that we can sample to our heart's content. And, and see really how consistent these activities are. And the upshot is they are very consistent. So this is just densities showing you that we get up to 10,000 or more items per liter. This is how it breaks down. And again, I know this is not fun to read, but uh, the gray shading is cereal material that's uncharred. The red is fruits and nuts. And then you get assorted other things uh, to the right-hand side. So it's a repeated, uh, crop and foraging story over and over again. Just a fun footnote for the for the bots people who are here. Um, and that is that it's also interesting to see that spectrum all the way from full carbonization to complete lack of charring. So you get a kind of singeing stage in between, which I know some of you will have seen that in material before as well. And the question is, what is really happening here with stuff becoming charred? And one possibility that we're thinking about and that had been pointed out by Lydia Zapata and Leonor Peña Chacaro, who have done ethnographic work in areas where gloom weeds are still grown, and that is that um, people will often kind of flash burn a pile of crop before processing just to get rid of the awns, that is the bristles, which are such a pain in the and the you know what, when you're trying to process crops and they get into your clothes, et cetera. So there may be something very um, similar to that happening here, which is leading to this kind of singed effect and occasionally charring material. The oilseed crops are there also, and it was something of a surprise to see opium poppy here. And you may know that, that opium poppy is not one of the crops from Western Asia. It was something domesticated in Europe. There's a very interesting project that we're collaborating with now by Ferran Antolin and Aurélie Salavert and others looking at the domestication of opium poppy. 
uh, we seem to see some size change over time, just to make sure Dorian's awake. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's something that we need to keep looking at. Um, and the surprise here was just because in charred assemblages, we don't tend to get much preservation of these oily seeds at all. Um, and yet they're clearly here when we have anaerobic preservation and so on and so on. And there's lots of fruits and nuts, but I've told you that already. And uh, this room is very warm. So I, I promise I'm about to wrap up. I just briefly want to look at that third question, which is the one of climatic barriers and testing grounds or testing grounds as a way of thinking about these regions rather than as barriers rather. So the Explo region is particularly interesting from the perspective of neolithization and agroecology because it lies on the edge of that initial early seventh millennium, earlier rather seventh millennium site distribution, which is mostly focused on the mildest Mediterranean zones. So what I'm saying is this splodge of red that you can see, that's this mildest Mediterranean uh, zone. It extends inland where it can follow river systems. And that is where the Neolithic is initially concentrated. That's the story of the seventh millennium BC. But what we're seeing in Explo and what we can also see further north with those yellow splodges is the Neolithic uh, spreading beyond that confine of the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, so that's giving us a new kind of purchase on that process of adaptation from Mediterranean to continental conditions. Yeah. And we now know from Explo dating that the initial establishment of lakeshore sites in our region, what I've shown here with the red uh, square, is chronologically parallel to what's then happening in Bulgaria and at the southern end of the Pannonian Plain, the Carpathian Basin, and so on. So what we're looking at here is um, a slowing down process in the spread of the Neolithic beyond that mildest Mediterranean zone, shown again here with cross-hatching, that is to do with the shift from Mediterranean to continental climate, and that is captured in these staggered limits that you can see for olive and for fig and for this north for vitis or grape. And so a hypothesis is that the eventual neolithization of these upland uh, lakeshore settings is to do with adaptation to climate change and the shift to warmer and wetter conditions, especially following the 8.2 event, that cold and dry event that is one of the most pronounced of the Holocene. Moreover, these upland lake basins with their harsher winters and wetter summers can be likened to the continental conditions of the northern Balkans. If we shift northwards to the Carpathian Basin to the Great Hungarian Plain, which you see in the upper left-hand corner, um, there is another pause through the early 6th millennium BC that is associated with further adjustment, it seems, to continental conditions, and then a shift further north with the emergence of the LBK, which we've talked about before, and the parallel development of Vincitelles in the later 6th millennium. So it would seem to be no coincidence that lakeshore sites in the southwestern Balkans, so in the Explo region, are reestablished and proliferate in the later 6th millennium BC, in parallel with Vincha and with the LBK, that was the culmination of the same process of adjustment to more continental conditions. So standing back now from some of the, the detail that I've presented, what did this early form of adjustment to more continental conditions involve in the Explo region? Well, from our bioarchaeological results so far at this video, <clears throat> it included a renewed focus on sheep herding, with sheep presumably confined to cleared arable plots in an otherwise heavily wooded environment. There was opportunistic hunting of roe deer that were probably invading crop fields from nearby woodlands. And in those fields were a diverse spectrum of crops, cereals, pulses, flax, opium poppy, including uh, a mixed crop of gloom weeds that I won't go into, but a kind of a maslin mixture that we also find in the Central European Neolithic. So there are some interesting connections there, and that's judging by that storage deposit that we hit at this video. There was also a good deal of foraging across a range of species from Mediterranean taxa through to more temperate continental types. 
Add to this the special opportunities of the lakeshore for mollusk collection and fishing, and you have a very diverse spectrum of seasonal food sources around a core of integrated cultivation and herding, a kind of reassertion of that central Neolithic dynamic of householding, cultivating, and herding. Thank you very much.